Hello again, this is another instalment of In Conservation With. My name is David Lindo, also known as The Urban Birder. In Conservation With, for those who are new to it, is a series of Zoom interviews in which I talk with movers and shakers within the world of conservation. And that could be anyone, there could be people writing books, there could be scientists, there could be lay people, it could be anyone who has a passion or has something to say about something. And tonight is no exception because I have my very dear friend, Ken Kaufman with me, who um, he and I are going to be discussing this whole subject um, regarding the changing of names of American birds. But before we go any further, let me just quickly introduce Ken to you. Ken, how are you and where are you? Um, I'm doing well. Um... I'm in northern Ohio. We've had a, a mild winter, as you can see. Um, and I'm uh, I'm really pleased to be joining you again. The, the last time we actually birded together was in Colombia. So it's uh, it's it's good to reconnect. Yeah, that seriously isn't the mild winter behind you, is it? <laughs> <laughs> um, let me just quickly tell you about Ken. Um, he burst onto the North American birding scene as a teenager in the 70s when he hitchhiked all over the continent in pursuit of birds, an adventure that later was later chronicled in his cult classic book, King Bird Highway. So this man is a, is a living icon. After several years as a professional bird tour leader, taking groups to all seven continents, he transitioned to a career as a writer, an editor, an illustrator. Uh, most of his energy currently goes into book projects and painting bird pro uh, portraits. His 13 books, 13, I hope you've all, I hope you've all got them, uh, <laughs> include seven titles in his own series, which is the Kaufman Field Guides, which are designed to encourage beginners by making the first steps into nature, um, nature study as easy as possible. Um, his next book um, is going to be called The Birds That Audubon Missed, is scheduled for publication in May 24, and he's going to be back again on In Conservation with, I'm sure, to talk about that with any luck, Ken. Um, you're a field editor for the National Audubon Society and a fellow of the American Ornithological Society, about whom we'll be talking tonight, and is the only person alive to have received the American Birding Association's Lifetime Achievements Award, not once, but actually twice. That is something. That is a big thing, Ken. Leading a double life. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, listen, let's get right into this. Um, the whole subject of tonight's In Conservation With is about the American Ornithological Society's decision to change the eponymous names of birds um, in the UK, sorry, in the US even, um, or North America. One, one thing I want to say straight away is the fact that Ken is not the AOS. He's basically here to talk about his opinion regarding this whole um, project. So before I carry on and ask Ken to actually tell us about his thoughts, let me just quickly read out from the uh, American Ornithological Society's website what they've said about this particular thing. They've said for several years, the AOS community has engaged in conversation about eponymous English bird names through a variety of activities and forums. On November the 1st, 2023, the AOS Council announced three commitments concerning eponymous English bird names. So the first point is the AOS commits to changing all English language names of birds within its geographic jurisdiction that are named directly after people along with other names deemed offensive and exclusionary, focusing first on those species that occur primarily within the US and Canada. The second point is the AOS commits to establishing a new committee to oversee the assignment of all English common names for species within the AOS jurisdiction. This committee will broaden participation by including a diverse representation of individuals with expertise in the social sciences, sciences even, uh, communications, ornithology, and taxonomy. 
And the third point is that they commit to actively involving the public in the process of selecting new English bird names. So there's also two other things I want to quickly run past you, and that is the AOS president, Colleen Handel. Um, she's um, put out a quote, and her quote is, there is power in a name, and some English bird names have associations with the past that continue to be exclusionary and harmful today. We need a much more inclusive and engaging scientific process that focuses attention on the unique features and beauty of the birds themselves. Everyone who cares and loves birds should be able to enjoy and study them freely. And birds need our help now more than ever. And one more quote for you, which is the AOS uh, Executive Director and CEO, Judith Skull. She said, as scientists, we work to eliminate bias in science, but there's been historical bias in how birds are named and who might have the bird named in their honour. Exclusionary naming conventions developed in the 1800s, clouded by racism and misogyny, don't work for us today. And it's time, the time has come for us to transform this process and redirect the focus to the birds where it belongs. I'm proud to be part of this new vision and I'm excited to work in partnership with a broad array of experts and bird lovers in creating an inclusive naming structure. So that's the official line from the AOS, the American Ornithological Society. Um, it's caused ructions in some quarters. I mean, I think there's no one that actually I know that's actually on the fence on this. People either love this idea or are totally against it. So I saw um, a few well, actually, maybe last week, I saw um, a post on Ken's Facebook talking about this whole subject. I thought it's really interesting because I like to talk to Ken, seeing as I really respect his opinion on these matters, just to find out where he's thinking, or how he's thinking, and where did he, how did he come to the, uh, the thoughts he has now. So, Ken, I want to hand it over to you to just, to just talk us through this whole process and and the way you stand on it okay well thanks dude I, I really appreciate the opportunity i mean it's always great to talk with you on any subject and and this is really a very interesting one that uh, it's been about six weeks since the aos made this announcement on november 1st and so i've been watching and following the reaction ever since and i'm I'm not really, you know, I, I wasn't on the committee that made the recommendations. I'm not on the AOS Council, um, but I've been interested in the issue for a long time. And I think I've seen a lot of comments from people suggesting that they didn't really understand uh, the situation or the background. So I thought uh, it might be helpful if I gave some of that context. And I, you know, I don't necessarily expect to change anyone's mind. But I think, you know, I may give people more different aspects uh, to think about. So uh, so I, I'd like to step back and just talk about the naming of birds. And, you know, David, this is all stuff that you know. But, you know, just for the benefit of people who may be listening who are, who are newer to the subject, uh, just the differences between scientific names and common names uh, are worth noting. Our, our system of scientific names goes back about 250 years to Linnaeus in the 1700s. And the 10th edition of his work, uh, Systema Naturae, in 1758, um, was the, the starting point uh, for all zoological nomenclature now. Um, any, any scientific name proposed before 1758 isn't official unless it you know, was brought back to the surface after that. So we have this system, the Linnaean system, uh, where each species has a unique name of uh, the genus and species. Um, so for example, the raven is, is Corvus corax. That was named by Linnaeus in 1758, and it's had the same scientific name ever since. Now, in applying scientific names, priority is the important thing. It's not the person who can write the best description or 
the person who discovered it necessarily, just the first diagnosable description with a name attached to it, that priority means everything. Um, and so, you know, species may be moved around from one genus to another, and it may change the first part of it. But, you know, you can't change the species name of the raven from Corax to anything else, unless you take it to this group called the International Commission on Zoological Nomenclature, the ICZN. Um, which um, the ICZN has 26 members in 20 countries and they're experts on the classification of living things of zoological specimens. Most of them are, you know, entomologists or they work with mollusks or something because, you know, those groups are a lot more complicated than birds. But if you wanted to change the specific name of a bird, the scientific name, you would have to take it to this international body and chances are they wouldn't agree to it. So these names are, they're ruled by very strict rules. The priority means everything, and it's extremely hard to change them. Now, the common names, the vernacular names or the English names that we're talking about now, uh, those, are, um, those are not nearly so formalized. Uh, early on, I mean, Linnaeus didn't give any English names to, he didn't give common names to birds at all. If he had, they would have been in Swedish. Uh, so the application of English names to these birds came along um, much more, more gradually. And the person who describes a bird to science doesn't necessarily get to uh, decide what its English name is going to be. The person who described the bird that we now call Wilson's warbler, uh, he called it the green black cap flycatcher. Um, <laughs> the person who described the bird that's now known as Bonaparte's gull, uh, he called it banded tail tern. So, you know, the, and all of these, you know, the, the English names changed frequently and they were not standardized uh, until anywhere until the 1880s. Now, the British Ornithologists Union came up with their first list of British birds in uh, 1883. The American Ornithologist Union, which was very much modeled after the BOU, uh, came out with their first list of North American birds in 1886. And so those were the first times there had really been official English names uh, for these groups. Now, the AOU is now the AOS, and I'm just going to refer to it that way you know, for the sake of simplicity. But the... Uh, their committee, the checklist committee of the AOS has existed ever since. None of the original members are still on it 140 years later. Uh, but it's uh, throughout its existence, uh, it's been top experts on classification of birds. You know, these are real expert, um, expert scientists. They really understand looking at things like DNA and structure and so on and putting together a classification of birds. Um, and so they've, you know, they've been responsible for developing the sequence of the list, uh, determining what the scientific name is, and also applying English names. Um, so, um, so in terms of the the AOS having the having the right to name birds uh, here in North America, that's been uh, that's been the case for 140 years, uh, more or less. Uh, but they, those names can change over time. Now, if you want to change the scientific name of a bird, you have to go to this international commission, and you have to have really good reasons. If you wanted to change the English name of a bird in North America, all that takes is a vote of this checklist committee of the AOS. So it's, it's, it's a much simpler thing. Now, a really important point to make here is that the AOS Council that made this statement about changing all these eponymous names, these, these name, the birds named for people. The AOS Council is not the same as the checklist committee of the AOS. And in fact, the checklist committee is opposed to this. So it, uh, it sets up an interesting dynamic. Um, and the part of the, part of the conflict here, um, is, is that the, the checklist committee is not keen on this. Um, yeah. the, 
I'm sorry, did, did you want to... Um... I, I, was, I was just about to interrupt you, but carry on, because you, you had some more to say, did you? Right, well, I wanted to get into this specific thing of the eponymous names, um, which is... Um, now, you you know, in Britain, um, when you're out on a day of birding, you're not likely to see many birds with eponymous names. There just aren't that many um, of your, your birds that are named after people. Uh, here in North America, there are quite a few, but the that trend didn't really get going until the 1820s. Uh, when John James Audubon was desperately trying to find species that were new to science, when he found something, often he would name it uh, for someone, some influential British or European person who might be able to uh, uh, support him or uh, you know, who might be influential. So, so Audubon was was running around handing out these eponymous names like like candy uh, in the 1820s. Then in the mid 1800s, um, 1850s into the 1870s, um, specimens from Western North America were being sent back to Eastern museums, and so ornithologists in Eastern North America again were applying lots of these eponymous names. They were naming birds like for their friends and colleagues. So, um, so this whole thing with, with birds in North America that are named for people, um, there were a lot of these names being established, you know, 1820s through 1870s. And so they were included in the first AOS checklist in 1886. And, you know, I started birding when I was a little kid in the 1960s and those names were just there. So I, you know, I learned them, I got used to them, and never questioned them. And I think most most birders in the U.S. and Canada, it's that way, you know, they look at the name, they never think about who that person was or what it means. Now, the, the point where this started to change was just about five years ago. Um, here in the United States, we had a civil war about 160 years ago, and some people are still sore about that. Um, the the southern states tried to secede from the Union uh, because they wanted to keep the practice of slavery because the whole economy was based on it. So they went to war, the North against the South, to stop the um, stop the South from from leaving. Um, and you know the, it was a long bloody war, and eventually the North won, and so the the Union stayed together. Um, but in the South, you still see people flying the Confederate flag and putting up statues to uh, Confederate uh, military heroes. And there had been there had been long simmering bad feelings about that because to some people those are just symbols of Southern heritage and Southern pride. You know, perfectly good people who just they'd grown up with them and thought, yeah, that's our that's our local pride. Then there were other people for whom these symbols they just symbolized um they symbolized uh defense of slavery so obviously there's a strong uh strong divide there and back about five years ago 2018 there was a student in north carolina who was looking at bird names and looked at a bird called mccown's longspur from western north america and was researching the background it turned out that john p mccown uh, for whom that bird was named, uh, he collected the first specimens in Texas in 1851. So, you know, it seems reasonable to name the bird for him. But he was also involved in military campaigns against Native Americans. And in the 1860s, he resigned from the U.S. Ar Army and became an officer in the Confederate Army. So this student, you know, Robert Dreyer was the name. He's, he looked at this and thought, well, this, this is a Confederate monument in the form of a bird name. He made a proposal to the AOS checklist committee. They don't they don't initiate most of the name changes. They just they get proposals in from scientists and they they look at these and make decisions. So um, he made this proposal to change the name of McCown's Longspur to something more descriptive and less um, less commemorative of the Confederacy. And the AOS checklist committee turned it down flatly. It was like seven to one vote, seven to one with one abstention. It's like, 
you know, we don't want to deal with this sort of politically correct stuff. But there was a huge outcry because there were lots of people in the birding and ornithology community who were saying, you know, this isn't acceptable. We want to have this name um, addressed. And so the checklist committee went back a year later and reconsidered it and changed that name from McCown's Longspur to Thickbill Longspur. But at that point, the gate had been opened. And so um, a group called Bird Names for Birds started circulating a, position, a petition asking um, to review all the eponymous bird names in North America. And that's what led the AOS to start considering this in 2020. Um, and they, you know, they realized, you know, I talked to officers of the AOS in 2020 and 2021. They were not keen on this whole idea. They didn't really want to deal with it. But there was so much public attention that they felt they had to do something. So they formed a committee. Um, it took a long time to form a committee of diverse, you know, people from diverse backgrounds to look at this and discuss, you know, how do we go about finding these, you know, the names that are really offensive and changing those. And earlier this year, I think everyone was surprised that that committee came back with the suggestion that, you know, we should just change all of these, get rid of all the eponymous names. So, you know, the AOS council had not been expecting that, but after a long debate, they wound up voting unanimously to accept the recommendation uh, from this ad hoc English Bird Names Committee. And that brings us to uh, where we are now. You were originally against this though, weren't you? Originally, I was opposed to the idea. I was dubious about the McCown's Longspur thing. And then when Bird Names for Birds uh, started circulating this petition to change all the eponyms, um, I actually, I knew a couple of the young people who were starting this, uh, Jordan Rutter and Gabriel Foley, really smart, dedicated, idealistic young people working. Uh, they both have jobs in bird conservation and ornithology. so. Um, the um i talked with them and um, i was initially trying to talk them out of the idea saying you know you'll never get this group to agree to change all these eponyms and we discussed it at great length and what happened was that they wound up convincing me and so i gradually came around to having a different outlook on it but what was it that changed your mind so what, what was the actual turning point for you? Well, lots of little things. Um, you know, initially the McCown's Longspur was was uh, presented as just sort of an isolated case, but you know, started looking into the background of other people who had birds named for them, and all these things started cropping up. Uh, our Scots Oriole, the name for a general, uh, Winfield Scott, who had zero interest in nature. You know, he wasn't a naturalist at all, but and, and in fact, he was involved in the whole process of removing the Cherokee from their ancestral lands in southeastern U.S. and moving them out west of the Mississippi. It was a forcible, a forced relocation. And Scott was in charge of that. So his name, you know, having that name on the bird was quite offensive to Native American birders, of whom there are some. And, you know, you, you look at that and start looking at um, their birds and Backman Sparrow is common and it's not common. It's actually elusive and hard to see, but it's in the Southeastern US. Um, and John Backman for whom it was named was uh, a white supremacist. He was a friend of Audubon's and was very interested in birds, but he wrote things. He wrote some really ugly things about how blacks are inferior to whites and how slavery was justified in the scriptures. He was a minister, he was a Lutheran minister. So, um, you know, having that kind of drivel uh, was especially damaging because, you know, as a member of the clergy, he was giving cover 
to other bigots and saying, well, you know, my preacher said it was okay. Um, so you, you have this, this Southeastern bird named for this white supremacist. Oops. Um, yeah. You start, you know, looking at other, um, um, you know, more and more things come up. Um, Abert, for whom Abert Stohe was named, was apparently involved in a massacre of Native Americans in California. Um, Clark, of the Lewis and Clark expedition and the Clark's Nutcracker, for years his job was to remove Native Americans from their ancestral lands. You get, you know, there are more and more examples like that. And then you get into borderline cases and the question was raised, you know, why should any of these birds be named for people? You know, what, what's the point? So, you know, once I started looking at that, you know, we could have years of argument about, okay, well, what about Forster? You know, Forster believed in, you know, like scientific, um, scientific support for racial hierarchies. Um, you know, what about Forster's turn? It, you know, it could go on and on. Um, forever um just looking at these people one at a time and wouldn't it be simpler just to say you know we're not canceling certain people we're not saying that all these people were bad just why have birds named for humans in the first place yeah we have um quite a lot of questions actually come up so we're going to hopefully talk to a couple of people to raise their points one or two questions i have and again it's just devil's advocate questions more than anything else. I don't really understand, and I think someone else may just raise this point in the uh, in the chat, why um, <clears throat> all, I, I still don't understand why all names had to be um, eradicated and why some people who are, you know, good scientists or, you know, had a noble background weren't being honoured, you know, because also selfishly, I'd love to discover a bird. No, I can't have a Lindo's parrot anymore. But anyway, um, so that's one. Um, and also the the idea that you, you mentioned earlier, the scientific name change is a difficult one, but surely some of those species also honor the, um, the, the person, the eponymous person um, in their in their scientific name. No. Well, yeah, I mean, there are there are lots of scientific names that do include the name of a person. But uh, trying, you know, trying to deal with changing those would be a lengthy impossibility. And there are also a lot of birds where the uh, the person's name is not uh, in the scientific name. You know, Scott's Oriole is Icterus parasorum. Uh, Backman's Sparrow is uh, Pucaea aestivalis. Um, Franklin's gull is Lara is uh, Leucophaeus pipixcan. They don't, you know, those those eponymous English names are not repeated necessarily in the scientific names, and they're also not being used by most people. You know, the for communication with the public, we're using these English names, and you know, not one person in a thousand goes to look and see what the what the scientific name is. So, so for communicating. Um, with the public, uh, the English names are, are really important. Okay. Um, I mean, I have one other, I mean, when I when we spoke about this privately, I had one really big issue about all of this. And even if just say, yeah, okay, let's fine, let's do that. The fact that it's only America or only North America, it kind of, because I can't see a lot of British birders, for example, maybe birders in the continent actually taking on these names. Um, but let's let's um, let's talk about that more widely. But what, firstly, before we actually get people to talk about this, what what are your thoughts on that, Ken? The internationality of it, or lack of? Well, it's. Uh, I mean, obviously, we don't have standardized English names for birds all over the world. There are a lot of birds that have different names in Britain than they do in North America. You know, your Arctic skua is our parasitic Jaeger. Your great northern diver is our common loon. Uh, your shore lark is our horned lark. Your sand martin is our bank swallow. There are lots of examples like that. And, you know, people aren't um, up, up in arms about it. Um, I haven't seen people 
uh, British birders, I haven't seen them complaining about the fact that we have different English names for some of these birds. And I'm not sure why uh, British birders would be so upset about us changing names of birds that are never going to make it to Britain anyway. You know, if you get a Scots Oriole there, I guarantee uh, it got there with human help. You know, they're, they're not going to fly there on their own. Yeah, but I think people think about things like Bonaparte skull and black Blackburnian warbler and all that sort of stuff. You know, they're, they're the ones that people may be concerned about. Um, yeah, no, I understand that. But they, you know, again, those are, and, and especially if you're an active British birder and you've been out looking for, you know, trying to find a Forster's turn uh, or something like that, it would be disappointing to have to, you know, change the name of that exciting rarity. Um, but, you know, I mean, you could, <laughs> the, the British Ornithologist Union Records Committee uh, could just go ahead and, and make the announcement that it will continue to be called Forster's Turn in Britain. Yeah, but does that not, uh, I mean, basically the whole idea is to, for me, is, is universal, to be universal about it, I suppose. Um, well, then shouldn't we be working on the Arctic skewer versus parasitic Jaeger? No, in terms of the, the eponymous names, I think, you know, if, if these people, you know, are as bad as, as they are, then it, for me, it should be universal, not, not just North America. It's like in, in Africa, I was in Kenya recently, and there's so many birds named after people, and I'm pretty sure that most of those people were colonial imperialists but they'll probably never change. And I think, you know, if you do it in one region, it should be done internationally. And I, I struggle to understand why or how there wasn't, or maybe there was, but there didn't seem to be a, cons a conversation globally about this. So that everyone changes everyone's names, you know, all the birds' names, because I think it'd be much better if, if the whole world did it, as opposed to just North America. Well, yeah, I mean, standardization would be a great thing. And I know people who have been working literally for decades. I mean, Frank Gill, Frank Gill back in the early 1990s was working on trying to get English names standardized you know, just between uh, North America and Britain. And it's still, it hasn't really gotten any closer in those 30 years. So, um, you know, saying that we can't make a change in names here without it being international. Uh, seems like it's like it's missing a, a point. Okay. And another thing, you know, you, you asked about why all the names should have to change. And the, the people who are opposed to this, I guess I could call them the human names for birds crowd, um, have been saying that, okay, if you change the name, you're canceling that person, you're erasing the history, you're lumping them in with the bad people. And that's not really, that wasn't really a driving, you know, beyond the first few birds, that wasn't really a driving force um, for the the people in, in favor of changing the names. It's more a matter of saying, why would this, why would this bird be named for that person? Let's, let's take Buick's Wren. Buick's wren um, is one of the few uh, new species that Audubon actually discovered. Uh, in 1821, he was in Louisiana and he thought he was finding a bunch of new species, but they, you know, they weren't. And he was giving them names like Selby's flycatcher and Rathbone's warbler and so on, naming them after people in Britain who might be influential. But he found this wren. And um, in, in October of 1821, he named it uh, Buick's Wren for Thomas Buick. Now, you know, as, as you know, Thomas Buick was uh, really an admirable character, a great uh, wood engraver, um, illustrator, a great naturalist. Uh, he certainly deserves to be honored and respected, but he has no connection to this Wren from Western North America. There's no connection at all, uh, other than the fact that Audubon was trying to suck up to these people in Britain to advance his own career. I mean, why should that wren be named for this guy? It's, um, you know, it, it just doesn't, there's no real connection. I mean, 
you know, you in Britain, you have very few, if you go birding for a day, you're going to see very few, um, very few birds that have eponymous names. Um, and, you know, what if we said, okay, these people are really admirable. They deserve to have bird names. Um, and Nelson Mandela is a personal hero of mine. And, you know, what if we said, okay, you're Chaffinch. We're going to change its name to uh, Mandela's Chaffinch uh, to honor this this great um, hero of, of, you know, equal rights. And um, I'm sure people would object. Um, and, and the, the, you know, it's the, they wouldn't be, you know, they wouldn't be racist. They wouldn't be claiming that Mandela didn't deserve to be honored. It would just be, you know, what does he have to do with the Chaffinch? So, um, uh, it's there are lots of names like that, names of North American birds. Um, you know, the Swainson's thrush, for example, is is one good example. William Swainson never saw it. The few things that he wrote about the North American thrushes were actually bad enough that they confused the situation still further. You know, the, the publication he did with John Richardson about the birds of Canada, uh, their text on thrushes was totally totally messed up so you know why does he have a thrush name for it you no know, uh, okay. it's um the, there are lots of things like that all right okay well um we'll talk about audubon a bit later but firstly let me let me try and get some people involved in this conversation uh giuseppe uh michali uh you made a uh, a comment early on are you alive are you live even well, i know you're alive but can you uh do you want to come and talk about your question giuseppe okay he's he basically disagreed with the decision and wondered why uh to cancel the name of a bird sorry name of a uh, to cancel the name of people from common name of birds it may be of the very same name will be preserved in scientific names or quoted as authors which have described the species. Hmm. Okay, well that's, that's his comment. Rachel Hopper, are you uh, available for comments, Rachel? Because you made a couple of comments. Yes, I'm here. Hello, Rachel. Hello. So you were talking about you, you actually, you disagree with the name changes as well. Um, I, I disagree with the wholesale name change. I do agree that if a name is harmful or exclusionary, then it should be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. Was, I disagree with the wholesale changing of, of these names. Um, I really don't think there's a valid rationale for it. Okay, okay. Right. Well, I, I appreciate that viewpoint, and I know that uh, that's shared by um, by a lot of people. And um, yeah, I have to say, I have good friends on both sides of this question. Um, so, I, and it's it's been a little distressing to see some of the harsh rhetoric that's been coming out from both sides. But the um, the committee. You know, the, the AOS Council set up this committee, um, the Ad Hoc Committee on English Bird Names, to discuss all this. And they were working on it for like a year and going back and forth and trying to decide, well, how do you, how do you choose? You know, how do you, where do you draw the line in figuring out who might be offensive and who isn't? I mean, I brought up the example of Forster. Um, um, even you know William Clark, uh, he's a hero to many people because of his role on the the Lewis and Clark expedition. Uh, but then there's there are also people who see the the damage that he did. Trying to get down into the weeds and separate all these people out could be like an endless process. And if you just decide that birds shouldn't be named for people, um, then you're not like specifically ruling against or passing judgment on certain individuals and not on others um it just i don't think we're really in a position to judge people from the past and we could avoid that if we just decided that that we we shouldn't have shouldn't have eponyms and and i would counter argue that 
the very basis of this movement is based on judgment and is a morality-based decision. People have been labeled as being racist, associated with the slave trade. Uh, there's a lot of colonialism involved. These are all judgment calls. These are all morality-based issues. So that door has been opened. So I think if you are going to jump through that door, then follow through. And I think erasing every eponymous name is a total cop-out. You've already made the judgment. You've already stated your moral stand. Follow through with it. Well, I would. I just want to point out the terms canceling and erasing have been brought up by the, those have been entered into the conversation by people who are opposed to the change. And it's not, it doesn't reflect the viewpoint of those who are in favor of the change. But making a moral judgment. Um, so you, I, I thought you had said, Rachel, and then, I've seen, you know, things you posted about it. I thought you had said that that you were all right with changing the names of birds that are named for people with really, really bad histories, with the, um, you know, the slave traders and the white supremacists and those who took part in Native American genocide. So you're, I, I'm, I'm not clear on whether you think it's acceptable to judge those people or not. Yeah, yeah, I do. I mean, I'll give you a perspective as a Jewish woman. If there was a bird named Hitler's warbler, I would object. I would feel that in my soul. It would affect me deeply. So therefore, I can empathize with other people that are affected similarly by birds that are named that are offensive to them. But what I want every eponymous bird name changed because I'm offended by a bird theoretically called Hitler's warbler. No, I think that should be addressed individually. And that's been my stand through this whole thing. Look at it as a case by case situation. It's gonna take some time. It's gonna take some effort. And actually the North American Checklist Committee volunteered to do it look at it case by case and make your decisions. I agree it's going to be difficult and it's going to take some time, but doing it this way does not dishonor the other people that have birds named after them that have nothing nefarious in their past. Okay, Rachel, thanks very much for your points. I, I want to try and bring in um, someone else now who's got a slightly different viewpoint. Um, Stuart Winter, are you around are you listening and are you are you able to uh, to talk hi david hi ken let's do it great because um i was saying to ken that i was looking um i was researching this whole subject and i noted that on a lot of the sort of british forums um most people if not all were totally and utterly against the whole idea but you wrote an article recently, didn't you, for um, for Birdwatching magazine, um, and yes. you had a different take, didn't you? Yes, it's yet to be published. I've been working with um, Bo Bolands, who's most probably the world expert on um, eponyms of, across the um, across the taxonomic board. Uh, he's written an excellent book called the um, the Dictionary of um, Eponyms, and gone into the details and. Bo and I are writing a um, sort of a debate. He's taking one side, I'm taking the other side. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm coming at it from sort of different points of view. I, I sort of look to the future and I think that um, if we are going to continue bird washing as a hobby, and perhaps even more importantly, if we're going to take conservation into the 22nd century, we need to be universal in the way we look at things. And I think it's, um, you know, the AOS has said about exclusionary names. I think we all need to sort of work and uh, walk in lockstep on this. And I don't know, are you, are you still hearing me? Yes, totally. Oh yeah, I just got a message coming up saying it's coming out in Italian. I'll just cancel that. Um, 
Yeah, so I think we've really got to think about people who are not involved um, in the bird watching scene at the moment. I mean, back in the UK, I, I think you'll accept this, David, is that it's very much a, a male white hobby. Um, pastime and I mean you've done so much work in actually taking things forward on this issue and I think if we're going to reach out into different ethnic communities either side of the Atlantic and around the world um, having a having a common language um, with, within English where bird names are easily to be understood um, I mean I was just sending a message over over a few moments ago about leeches petrol and that doesn't say anything about the bird um, it's, it's one bird that I think that um, we're going to have to discuss with the Americans because it breeds in North America and in um, and here in Europe. And I think it would be you know, good for us to work together and actually have a common name. But um, going back to the, the actual issue, I, I've spoken to quite a few Americans. I've spoken to um, Ken about it and to um, Alvaro uh, Aramio and um, Julian Huff and people like that. And there just seems to be this um, consensus that it's a good thing. And, I, and I've learned from that. So um, so go, going forward, I think that the one thing that I would like to see is perhaps some British bird watchers being invited by the AOS to actually add their contribution. Because I think the names that we're going to look look at, they've got to be really exciting names. I mean, unfortunately, McCown's um, Longspur ended up as thick-billed Longspur. And that doesn't that sort of um, take on the atmosphere of his habitat or some of the subtle um, plumage details. Um, I think we've got to be really, really sort of forward-looking on this and to get people involved in, you know, taking it as an opportunity of putting birds, birds' names into a... Um, into a new stadia so that we can all get involved together. Okay, that's, that's a really interesting point, Stuart. I want to bring Bo into this because you were working with him on this. Hello, Bo. Um, where do you sit on this? Um, couldn't be more opposite, really. Um, I, I don't buy into the argument that 99.9% um, .9 recurring of people are going to be offended by the names because 99% recurring don't know who they are. They have no idea who Scott or Backman or the other people are. People are constantly confused between Clark's this and Clark's that when there's two or three Clark's about. So I don't, I don't buy into that for a start. I don't buy into changing history or trying to change history by um, you know, rewriting the book, as it were, unless you take it all on. And therefore, you've got to change the name for Carolina and Virginia and you know all those other eponyms out there. You've got to change the name for Biro of a robot, of everything else that's ever named after people. Because very quickly after something gets named, the person that they're named after becomes obscure. Um, the name is the name. And the other side of that coin is if you're going to change the name because it doesn't relate somehow, then you have to change names of birds like American Robin. I mean, it's not a Robin, it's a <laughs> you know, there's, there's a whole you know bunch of stuff around there that, that uh, it doesn't make sense. And for me, the, the issue is not about, about whether or not um, the, the people birds are named after have a, you know, are bad. It's about why they were named after them. Um, and I'd quite happily throw out an awful lot of those patrons and, and big figures that were, you know, had nothing to do with birds or ornithology or science or whatever going. But the fact that Bad people did good things, for example, you know, and discovered stuff or were out there looking for things or, you know, and in, in the same way, we, we don't deny the science that was put, pushed forward by world wars, um, you know, that advances things. But there's horrible histories there that create those things. And we should be looking at those histories. We should be being more and more and more open about those histories and uh, displaying those names and saying, this guy did this, but he also did this, which was horrendous, right? You know, in the same way over here, and why it's a debate in the UK, I think, is because we've gone through a bit of this thing about um, chucking statues in the sea of, of people that are being lauded for one thing, but are actually appalling at something else. And for me, I want to see a museum of racism. I want to see those things displayed with different plaques on, 
saying this is why this guy was here because he did this thing which people thought was good but he was horrendous really you know and we we've got to all look at all our heroes churchill had you know feats of feats of play even even david attenborough spent his his, his early career collecting animals in the wild when he you know to for zoos i mean you know they're not for conservation at all all of us do bad things and the only people that do that don't admit to being ashamed about something they've done in the past are psychopaths who don't recognize the whole idea of guilt so i, I think that you know it's it's taking the minutiae of one area and trying to apply a set of rules to it that isn't applied in the whole of the rest of life and i think it obscures the bad stuff not makes it they disappear okay well thanks for your point bo i want to bring ken in on this now what are your thoughts ken Okay, well, yeah, obviously a lot of a lot of different uh, opinions being expressed, and you know the the checklist committee, the AOS checklist committee now is saying that they'd be willing to uh, look case by case at at these uh, eponymously named birds and consider removing some of them. But that is a switch from where they were just four years ago, where they just refused to look at any of these. Um, I think they're, uh, you know, they're coming around, uh, perhaps slowly. Um, but the to go back to the the reason that the AOS wanted to address these names was because they wanted to make ornithology and birding more welcoming and more inclusive. And something that um, I haven't seen mentioned at all by the opponents is that here in the United States. Um, there's been a very positive response uh, from from people of color. I don't know if you know who Christian Cooper is. Um, he's a, a black guy, a birder from New York. He wrote a book um, called Better Living Through Birding. He's the host of a birding television show on National Geographic. And he wrote, um, his exact words were something like, this is a very welcome and welcoming move to those of us who have not always felt welcome here in the past. So he's he likes the idea of just doing away with these eponyms. Dr. Drew Lanham, who's a, a well-known black ornithologist, is very much in favor of this. Other you know, leaders among the black US birding community, which is a community that didn't exist 30 years ago, uh, people like, like Doug Gray and Jason Hall and Audrey Peterman, Tyke James, um, They've all come out openly um, saying that they're very they're happy about this this approach of changing these you know just doing away with the eponymous names and they they appreciate the fact that the AOS is willing to do this so you know and likewise for people I know who are Asian American Filipino American um, Native American there's a lot of positive energy uh, behind this and a lot of young people. Most of the young birders that I know are fine with this. So most of the opposition is coming from uh, a group that's that's uniformly uh, white and with an average age of about seventy. And I know I'll be I'll be quoted out of context for this, and people will um, <laughs> people will attack me for having said this. But, you know, some of my best friends are white. You know. And I myself am going to be in the category of being white and 70 years old before too long. Uh, there's nothing, um, there's nothing, um, nothing wrong with that. But we see this pretty clear divide between older white birders being very much opposed to the change and a younger and more diverse crowd accepting it. And I'm not making a value judgment about either group, but I think it's worth noting that. It's really, it's really interesting. It's a shame that the audience is, you know, not very diverse because it'd be really interesting to hear voices from, um, you know, people of colour on this subject as well. And I know that in Britain there's even fewer uh, burners of, of that persuasion. So it's going to be difficult to get a balanced kind of, kind of view on this. Um, and I know that... Uh, you know, there's a few more questions. I want I want to try and get as many people's you know talking as possible because I think 
it's good to cover all, 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 you know, all opinions and, and thoughts. I mean, I have my, I mean, it's interesting to talk about the, 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 the leading black birders in the US and they all unanimously think, you know, agree with the, what's going on. And it's, it's something that I've always felt um, is quite different in the UK because we're almost once removed you know, we're not actually living, because I go to America, I've got, you know, family who are in America, and I've got friends, and I can feel that a lot of that history is still living with them. Whereas in the UK, it kind of, you know, it gets dissipated because you're not actually living amongst that whole sort of atmosphere, but then you've got your own thing to deal with when you're in Europe or, or Britain. So it's, it's a very different sort of concept. Um, and for me personally, when I heard of this, I, I kind of agree with what Bo said earlier in terms of, you know, during lockdown when people were smashing down statues. And for me, I, I prefer the idea. I mean, I, it didn't come to me immediately, but I had to think about it. And I thought, well, actually, keep it up there, but put a plaque saying this guy's not a good guy. And he has the reasons why. So that people can remember that as opposed to it not being there at all. Anyway. We can talk about that all night. Stephen Holt had a couple of questions, or had a had a, a point to make. Are you still with us, Stephen? Stephen? Well, he wants ornithologists to concentrate on taxonomy and not history, and he's glad um, that they have chosen not to uh, parse history and just get this behind us. The moment any of uh, the honoured dead people complain that they've lost their bird names, he might change his mind. It sounds uh, very reasonable. Uh, Marty, are you around at all? Because you had an interesting point earlier. Marty. Yes, I'm here. I'm actually Josh. Marty's my wife. <laughs> well, Josh, <laughs> pleased to meet you. You as well. Um, Ken, my question for you is, is eponyms are, are one thing here. Um, but it only took 2,500 signatures to get an ad hoc committee created. Um, but the offense does not stop there. Um, country names, America, Canada, they have pretty atrocious histories with indigenous peoples and slavery. Uh, Mexico, they, they didn't pay for the wall, right? So they should go too, right? That's a joke. Um, but References to royalty, um, religious references. I mean, it's it's uh, it's not too crazy to think that another petition is going to come out to say the Northern Cardinal needs to be changed because of the religious reference. And then how far does it go from there? Is someone going to start a petition with the state of Ohio to change the name of McGee Marsh you know I the question where does where does this stop because this is opening a door people can find offense in everything where does it stop well I, I I've seen you know this the slippery slope argument uh, has been really popular um but I I don't. Uh, I generally don't have to have a high opinion of that kind of argument. I, it's often used. Um, you know, I'm. I, I recognize the sincerity of what you're saying, but um, I think people often will use that kind of argument to avoid doing something that would be a good thing to do. Like, yeah, you know, we can't do that because then. You know, you, we can't let women learn how to read because next thing you know, they'll want to be voting, things like that. Um, I'm sorry, that's, that's kind of a snarky comparison. I shouldn't use that. But I think, you know, changing the name of a bird doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to go changing everything else. The AOS doesn't have, um, doesn't have authority over what... Um, you know what cities are called or anything like that and they've made it very clear um it'd be worthwhile to go you know you can go to the aos website and read their entire statement you can read the entire recommendation from the ad hoc committee and they're very they're definitely not talking about changing the geographic names 
Um, you know, well, they just okay. want. I, I read the entire ad hoc committee. Um, okay. They they very clearly um, made it. They, they made it very clear that they were not touching on any of that because their charge in this was eponyms only. Right. All right. So they they made no. They got the cop out behind that basically. Okay. So right. it it wasn't a, a it wasn't a recommendation for anything beyond that. Um, it is a sincere question because this this won't, it won't stop. I mean, we have we have at least eight birds named after states that were members of the Confederacy. If if we're going to start taking down eponyms with people, and I am fully in favor of taking down Scots, I had no issue with the McCowns thing. But if we're going to do that. I mean, their logic on this dictates that we cannot stop at eponyms. Well, I I think you're putting words into their mouths or putting putting intentions into their. I mean, they they made it clear they weren't going to go for secondary eponyms where a locality or a geographic area is named for a person. That's you know until until the name of America gets changed. You know, they're not going to change the bird names that have things like American Robin. Um, I, I, I just, I, I don't, I, I personally don't think that the slippery slope argument is really a compelling one here. Um, the, the, the plan here was very sharply um, delimited. And you know it's just the eponyms plus three other names that were considered to be uh, offensive. One of those being uh, Eskimo curlew, since the term Eskimo is now considered to be an offensive catch-all for a number of uh, unrelated groups of people living in the far north. Okay, um, Marty. Thanks. We we need to move on because there's lots of people um, that I want to hear from. Um, but thanks for your comments. Um, Jeff Marks, are you around? I am for a little bit. Okay. Um, can you uh, voice your question? Well, well, I, I was just hoping Ken or, or someone would touch on exactly how the council arrived at the decision. That that's one of my questions. Um, in in terms of who they received input from and what did they do with that input? Okay, well, the the council, I mean, the, the council of the AOS is an elected group. I mean, you know this, Jeff. The, yes. It's an elected group. They have regular turnover. So the people on the AOS council this year are not the same as those in 2020 when this first heated up, but they there was enough public pressure. They knew they had to do something. So they took a long time and a lot of care to create this ad hoc committee to make the recommendation, which which you've read. The whole the whole recommendation from their committee is is available on the website. But then they took that and um, I haven't spoken to everyone on the council, but I've talked to a couple of them, and they um, they took this recommendation from the ad hoc committee and they discussed it at great length. Um, it was literally days of discussion uh, before they came around to the point of it being a unanimous vote in favor of accepting the recommendations from the committee. So it wasn't a it wasn't a preconceived uh, conclusion. It wasn't a foregone conclusion. And I think, um, I think a lot of them were just as surprised as I was that the ad hoc committee came up with a recommendation they did. And I was surprised that the council came around to uh, voting unanimously in favor of it. Yeah, well, I'm, you know, like, like you, I'm a fellow and I'm a former council member a long time ago. But what, what do you, I mean, how do you feel about the, the fact that they really didn't solicit input from the fellows or the elective members or or even the general membership how, how does that sit with you i was uh, i was surprised 
but the um, the ad hoc committee had spent so much time discussing this that I mean I you know the discussion I've seen um, in you know in the last six weeks since the announcement was made has gone over all this ground that was already tread by the uh, the ad hoc committee and I I thought that the decision they came to was really wise. I mean, we've the idea that the taxonomic committee also chooses the English name. That was a good thing in 1886. Um, you know, some things in the world have changed since then, and they, um, I think, they've realized that the people who were real experts on classification and on scientific nomenclature may not be the most sensitive to what are the best names to present to the public? You know, as, as evidenced by the fact that the checklist committee initially, um, the checklist committee initially uh, rejected the petition on the McCown's Longspur. They were reluctant to change the name of the old squaw to long-tailed duck. Uh, they totally rejected the uh, earlier petition to change the name of the so-called Maui parrot bill to a more Hawaiian sounding name. Um, I think the, you know, I have great respect for the members of the checklist committee. A lot of them are longtime friends of mine. Um, you know, they're, they're great experts on classification and scientific names, but um, I think we're in an era now where we have to recognize that the common names of birds serve a larger purpose. They're not just for communication, among ornithologists and serious brooders. These common names, um, they they face the public and they, they have to be considered in a different light. Okay, all right, well, th thanks for that, uh, Ken. Okay, well, thanks, Jeff. I appreciate the comment and it'd be good to sit down with you at a meeting at some point and talk about this. Yeah, I would love that. Okay, well, thank you very much, Jeff, for your con contribution. Um, anyone else for any questions, please put your hand up, but I'm kind of asking another question here, which is, um, with all the new names coming through, what, what's the process? How's that going to work? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> it's, you know, how is it going to work? Um, they're still working on, uh, putting together the, they're going to have a committee to deal with English names. I, I don't think it will be the same as the ad hoc committee that was advising on the process. There might be one or two of the same members. Um, but hopefully it will be a diverse group of people with a good understanding of uh, social issues and communication as well as ornithology. And hopefully some really serious expert ornithologists uh, to have input on that. And I believe what they're planning to do is start with a relatively small group of species and go through the process of soliciting suggestions, of putting things out, not necessarily for a public vote because we don't want, you know, Bodie McBoatface, but doing a, doing a straw poll to get the, um, to get a, a reaction to, um, you know, how people, how people feel about the names. You'll never get a hundred percent support for any name. That just doesn't happen. Um, so you know they, <laughs> they we can't can't go for a hundred percent. But you know anything that would be acceptable to the majority, um, you know that that seems like a reasonable approach. I want to bring Rachel back into this because she's been quite vociferous on the uh, chat. What what are you thinking, Rachel? Rachel Hooper. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry, Rachel Hopper, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I, I really um, disagree with the whole concept of allowing the public to create a common name for a species. Um, I have a very close friend, that, and I know that Ken knows Kevin Zimmer, and I know many of you are probably familiar with Kevin. Um, He's the one who discovered Parker's spine tail. He, he's 
spent, I, I don't know how much time, um, first of all, recognizing that there was a vocal difference between that bird and other spine tails in the area. Then he went about recording it and analyzing it. I mean, the amount of time that he spent discovering this species and differentiate it from the other spine tails in the area was incredible. How does he not get to name that bird? First of all, he named it um, Parker's spine tail and he gives a very detailed explanation as to why he chose that eponym. We all know who Ted Parker was. And there are so many birds that are so similar in the same area that he couldn't decide on a, a, a name that wasn't, that didn't involve an eponym. But, but my point is, he deserves the honor of not only giving that bird a scientific name, but also a common name. He's the one that put in the blood, sweat, and tears. He's the, 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 we, the general public, I don't think appreciates the amount of time and work that goes into the whole process when you discover a new species. That's really my primary objection. Before you answer the question, Ken, I want to quickly say that not everyone knows who Ted Parker is, particularly those who might be watching this in the future on YouTube. So maybe Ken, if you can just quickly tell us who Ted Parker was. Okay, well, Ted Parker was a dear friend of you, and he was a genius on the tropical American birds. Um, he uh, actually revolutionized neotropical ornithology and uh, then uh, tragically died in a plane crash in the 1990s when he was just 40 years old. Um, for a new protected area. So he, he deserves obviously to be honored in multiple ways. And 50 years would met 50 years ago this year uh, when we were teenagers. And I have great respect for Kevin and his work. Um, he didn't provide the scientific name for Parker's spine tail because it had been described as a subspecies many years ago by someone else. But, you know, he did do the work to prove it was a full species. He did uh, name it Parker's spine tail. And, you know, I, I recognize that some people are going to regard this as as canceling or erasing a person, um, but I've known a number of people um, who had birds named for them. Uh, Ed Willis, uh, Willis's uh, ant bird. I knew Ed Willis. I knew Alec Forbes Watson, who has the Forbes Watson Swift name for him in Africa. Um, I think if it becomes a like a blanket. Uh, policy not to have eponyms um, for birds in North America. You know, they've said they're going to uh, proceed really slowly when it comes to trying to address South American birds. And that really, you know, the United States and Canada shouldn't be dictating what those birds are called. Um, so, you know, who knows, maybe you know, it's possible that South American ornithologists will decide they want to keep all those, um, those English eponyms. You know, it's it's possible, um, but I, you know, Rachel, I want you to know, I definitely don't want to uh, disrespect Kevin Zimmer or uh, the late Ted Parker or any of the people on the checklist committees who are up in arms about this. But you know, the the checklist committees have this long-standing status as unelected groups. They select their own new members, so there's a certain uh, sameness of opinion on the checklist committees. They have no term limits, so they've never, um, um, you know, they, they've never been questioned. Uh, their their ability to dictate the English name of every bird has never been questioned, and I know some of them are outraged now because they're they're being questioned. But I think it would be. You know, rather than engaging in some of the harsh rhetoric that I've seen from some of them, it would be good if they could take part, you know, in, in rational debate, not just lash out. Yeah. Thanks, Rachel, for that. Fran, 
Fran, would you like to uh, just come in on what you just said? Hi. Hi Sorry, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to find the unmute button. Um, I'll do the video as well. Hi. Hi, Fran. Um, yes, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm not a bird expert in any shape or form, but just looking um, as a sort of outsider in a way, um, it just seems to me it would be much simpler to, to have all the birds with no human name at all and honour humans in, in a different way. So buildings that are associated with birds or some some other way, you know, I, d I don't see that that naming that a bird has has got to be the only way forward. So that's really what I wanted to say. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And, and I agree with you. <laughs> Right. Simple as. <laughs> right. I, yeah, I haven't got much more to say. I mean, I'm just thinking as I go along, as, as some pe other people might be as well, you know, how they feel, given what other people are saying. Um, yeah, that's all I have to say, really. Okay, well, thank you for for that. Um, we want to bring um, Ashley Kimberly. Kimberly Kaufman has just made a comment. So, Kimberly, hello. Thanks, friends, by the way. Thank you. Okay. Hello, David. How's my bird brother? <laughs> I'm doing very well, thank you. I've got two legs still breathing. It's all good news. But thanks for hosting this forum today. Um, I appreciate that there are um, a number of different positions, but that everyone has been very respectful. The birds need us to, to do that, not to get so divided by this issue that we forget that birds need us to focus on things like cats and building collisions and habitat loss. Just imagine if we put this collective energy into things like that, what we could actually accomplish for birds. And I just think it's such a human thing to do to try to saddle birds with human names. Um, you know, it's not too much of a leap from there to say, well, we could just put corporate sponsors names on birds and and generate a bunch of funds for for uh, conservation. It's ludicrous. Um, I, I think there are a lot more meaningful ways to um, to preserve ornithological history. I don't really think that the human names for birds is a good portal anyway. We work a lot with young people and I've um, quizzed, um, and I'm talking about kids, people under 30. <laughs> um, and I asked them, Do you, have you ever thought about the name Scott's Oriole? Um, it, they're just not, once people know who they are, they're, they're some pretty awful people. Um, but I, I think there are other more meaningful, impactful ways that we can preserve ornithological history and um, honor those significant contributions. Absolutely. Well, thanks for your comment, Kimberly. Hope to see you again soon, by the way. Uh, let Much me, love to you, David. Thank you. Let me just switch over to Bill, who's just put something up on the chat. Um, we've got about 10 minutes left. So have you got a quick question or statement, Bill? Well, maybe not. He was asking, please talk about the value of descriptive naming and renaming. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's uh, um, there. There's so many great possibilities, and actually, a, a Facebook, um, a Facebook group formed over here in the states called uh, I think it was Bird Names for Birders, and um, the it's a private group, so you know you can't. You can't go and, and read it, but uh, it's mostly young people. I know a ton of people who are in it who are, you know, under the age of 40, and they're just really excited about the possibilities of coming up with new names uh, for these birds, new descriptive names. Um, you know, the, the, the Buick's Wren that I mentioned is one possibility. It's, it's got this great personality. It's really a lively, uh, a lively bird. And you know, again, there's nothing wrong with Thomas Buick. Uh, he deserves to be respected, but he has no connection to this bird. Let's give it a name that, that celebrates it. And, you know, descriptive names. Um, one thing I need to say, uh, people keep going back to thick-billed longspur, a name chosen by the checklist committee as an example of a terrible name. But um, I actually think it's good. Uh, which when we changed from accounts to thick build, uh, Van Remsen pointed out that uh, 
any all the other names that were suggested were were inappropriate in one way or another. Either they were describing field marks just of the male, leaving the female out, or they were describing a geographic area where the bird lived only part of the year, or they were describing a habitat that either wasn't distinctive or didn't apply all year. But thick build, you know, it actually does have a thicker bill than other long spurs. That's one of the best field marks for it in winter. And it reflects the ecology of the bird, living in dry areas and feeding on larger seeds. It's got a thick bill. Oh, I, th I think it's a great name. You know, any <laughs> any any bird name that you suggest, at least 33% of people won't like it. But you know, that's that's not really a great, a great example to point out. But we can get great descriptive names for all these birds and just think how exciting it would be. You know, when you go out, you know, it's that's not just a Casson sparrow, it's a glorious sky dancer, you know? <laughs> there, there's great potential there. Well, the thing is, with a thick build long spur, I can't argue with you. I have to get on my knees to you because obviously you know more than most people about thick builds, long spurs, <laughs> and other species, um, to, to come to think of it. Um, we've got like a few minutes left. I just wondered if anyone who hasn't spoken yet would like to speak. Um, on this subject, because it's good to have a, 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 a range of voices. Um, so is there anyone that would like to <coughs> excuse me, ask her the, basically the closing question? Any of you lovely people? No? Oh, hang on, I've got a couple of chats down here, because the thing is, I'm, I'm doing all the moderating at the moment and it looks like it's most of the same people that have already spoken the only person i think that i noticed say stuff recently um was sky um are you around sky i think it's hi hey dave hey ken i i am uh I, I really don't have too much to say other than to expand what uh, Ken was just talking about, that uh, when uh, the, the AOS first came out with this uh, information, uh, I, I found it very exciting, very exhilarating. Uh, I thought it was like, this is a chance for us to go forward and come up with some great new names. Uh, a chance, you know, a chance that uh, we could go and make a more inclusive era uh, for uh, people of color and indigenous people. Uh, you know, even if it is just a handful of people that uh, would feel more welcomed into ornithology and birding, then that is a big win. Uh, and then from from there, uh, I just I don't I don't feel a need for you know birds to. Uh, bear the names of of uh human patrons you know we can find other ways to honor our our leaders and our heroes and our researchers um and you know some of my favorite bird names are ones that are descriptive some that have you know some pizzazz to them i you know i know the group that uh ken was just talking about i was participating uh I wish I could claim to be one of those under 40 kids still, um, even though I, you know, act like it at times. But uh, it, uh, you know, it was a very exciting time coming up with uh, just a bunch of the, some of these kids coming up with some of these uh, ideas for potential names. And that's what strikes me as uh, the most positive uh, aspect of all of this is that uh, it's a chance to be, I think, creative as a community and, uh, uh, you know, put a little art into the science of birds. And uh, I, I, I like that. I mean, you know, we look at Lewis's woodpecker and my my take on it is it is a glamorous bird and that that's what i think we should be calling it glamorous woodpecker um so anyways that's uh that's what i got to say so but uh thank you for this discussion it's been fantastic i've really enjoyed it good well that's such a positive end uh a lovely sort of uh, end to the uh to the discussion would you not think ken 
Yeah, I, I really appreciate that. And, um, and again, you know, I want to say um, I have good friends on both sides of this question. I have, uh, I have great respect um, for people engaged in this discussion from both sides. And I hope that we can continue to discuss it in a way that's that's calm, you know, civil and clear and and you know pin uh, our arguments to facts and you know look at history and look at the future and look at the makeup of of society, uh, you know, as as we figure out how we're going to go forward with this. And David, I really appreciate the opportunity. It's always great to talk with you and. This has been really, uh, really stimulating. Uh, uh, listen, Ken, I'm delighted for you uh, that you actually came on as well. I'm delighted. Um, I, I, I echo it back to you. I'm just delighted that we had the opportunity to talk. Um, so basically, we've come to the end of uh, In Conservation With. It's a very special one tonight, uh, this afternoon, talking with Ken Corfman about the uh, proposed changes of the eponymous names of birds in North America. Um, please keep watching In Conservation with us online uh, on the Urban Birder channel. Uh, so please like and subscribe. Um, we have loads of conversations over the course of well, the last four years, three years, but also coming up as well. Um, including tomorrow, if you're around, we're talking to a guy called Mark Thomas, who actually works with the RSPB and is talking about the bird crime report, um, which doesn't make good reading actually. Um, but we've got lots of different subjects. It's not just about birds. It's all about every taxa, everything to do with conservation and natural history and what have you. So you'll find all sorts of different subjects that might interest you, including cryptozoology, which we had last week. But um, Ken, I want to thank you again for for sparing your time today to talk about this particularly thorny subject um i thought you did it admirably and i've even sort of i'm thinking now so thank you for making me think <laughs> well thank you so much dude um uh, it's, it's always so great to talk with you on on any subject and i enjoyed this immensely Brilliant. And Zoomers, uh, for those who don't realize you are a Zoomer, once you are on Zoom, you're a Zoomer. Zoomers, thank you very much for uh, for attending today and all your really interesting questions. I know there's a lot more that's been unanswered, um, but really appreciated your participation in tonight. So all I want to say to all of you and including Ken is take care of yourselves. Have a wonderful uh, holiday season. And keep looking up. We'll speak soon. Take it easy. Bye.